Welcome to the second lecture on wireless communication. My name is Henk Weiners and I'm with Chalmers University of Technology. In this second lecture, we'll go over some of the topics of uh, chapter two in the book, Wireless Communication by Andrea Goldschmidt. In particular, we'll talk a little bit about antennas, path loss shadowing and multipath fading. Multipath fading will actually be covered in more detail in the next two lectures, and then models for path loss and shadowing. Specific learning outcomes for today are the statement and interpretation of freeze law, differences between path loss shadowing and multipath fading, the description of at least two path loss models in mathematical terms, and uh, the ability to compute outage probabilities due to path loss and shadowing. To understand the wireless channel, we should in principle work with Maxwell's equations. These are provided here on the right, just for information. However, these expressions are quite complicated for use in communication system. So we will instead work with simple models using a far field theory of planar waves. So to understand this, we consider here a so-called half-wave linear dipole antenna. And on the right side, we see if the antenna dipole is oriented along that side, the vertical axis, the radiation pattern. So when we are very close to the antenna, the radiation pattern is curved. So this is called the near field. But when we get very far away from the antenna, the radiation pat pattern will be flat. So this is called the far field radiation pattern, which happens at distances that are sufficiently far away from the antenna. This far field radiation pattern itself can be directional or non-directional, depending on the type of antenna. But it allows us to use this planar wave theory and in turn to use ray-based models. So rays are launched from a transmitter to receiver and are perpendicular to the planar waves. Under this ray-based model, here we consider a ray or a wave approaching an obstacle. So we see these parallel lines that represent the wave. And then there can be different effects due to the interaction of this wave with the obstacle. So when the obstacle is relatively flat with respect to the wavelength, we will have reflection. It is also possible for some object to allow transmission through the object. If the object is relatively rough with respect to the wavelength, then we can have scattering in different directions. And finally, we can also have diffraction around the corners of objects. So these three different effects depend on the wavelength with respect to the size of the object. It also means that we don't necessarily need a line of sight between a transmitter and a receiver to communicate, because we can rely on reflected signals, on scattered signals, on signals going through objects and signals refracting around corners. Using these properties, we can then predict what the receive power will be at different locations with respect to a certain transmitter. So this is called ray tracing. So here in this picture, we have in the middle a transmitter. And then we launch ray from this transmitter in different directions. They interact with the objects, okay, according to the different ways that we've seen above. And then we can compute the power at each of these locations. So we see when the user is in the line of sight with respect to the transmitter, we will have high power. When the user is behind an object, it is shadowed. So we see the shadow here very clearly. But the user still has a relatively high power. When the user is far away and may be blocked by multiple objects with respect to the transmitter, then the power will be very, very low. We now look at ray tracing in a little bit more detail for a simple case of a single path. So we consider a transmitter and a receiver and a single path between them, a line of sight path. The transmitter sends a signal U of t, this is U of t, this is up converted with the carrier frequency and then arrives at the receiver in the form of R of t. We ignore the noise here and then the channel is given by this uh, complex number. So we see a number of effects. First of all, a rotation due to the propagation with the distance and this is because we're sending basically a carrier, and then depending on how many complete rotations we have, there will be a complex rotation at the end. Then we have a decay with distance, so the power goes down with distance. And finally, we have the effect of the antenna. So here, GL relates to the gain of the receive and transmit antenna in the line of sight direction, and lambda is the wavelength, which relates to the carrier, and it's a function of the antenna aperture. 
Okay, so we see again three effects, a distance dependent rotation, a distance dependent power decay, and then an effect due to in the wavelength and the gain of the transmit and receive antenna. If we take the power of the received signal, and write, we can write as a function of the power of the transmit signal in the following way. So the received power at a certain distance d is a transmitted power, so that's a transmitted power of u of t, times the gain of the transmitter, times the gain of the receiver, along the line of side direction, times a multiplicative constant, okay, lambda over 4 pi d squared. This is called the free space path loss factor. Okay, so we see that the power decays as the square of the distance between transmitter and receiver. We can write this in the dB domain, okay, by taking the transmit power in the dB, the antenna gains a transmitter and receiver along the line of side direction, and then a bunch of constants, and then this factor that depends on d. When we have two paths between transmitter and receiver, things become a little bit more complicated. Okay, so we again have the rotations for each of the paths. Okay, that could be a short path, line of sight between transmitter and receiver, and then a reflected path along the ground between transmitter and receiver. The reflected path has a delay that's different, so we'll have a different rotation. Okay, the delay also affects here. Then we have the effect of the distance of the line of sight path and a uh, reflected path. And then finally we have the gain in the line of sight direction and in the reflected direction. So we can again evaluate the power as a function of distance, and it would look something as shown on the figure here on the right. So the x-axis is the logarithm of the distance, and the y-axis is the received power. And we see that the received power goes down with distance, but it has this fluctuating pattern. And this is because of the additive or destructive interference between the two paths. When we go on to more complex propagation environments, ray tracing is, uh, becomes no longer tractable. For that reason, we look to more simplified models. If we were to visualize the received power as a function of distance for a series of experiments, we would see a figure as shown here. So the x-axis shows the logarithm of the distance with respect to some normalization distance d0. The y-axis shows the received power with respect to the transmit power. And we would see three different effects. So roughly, the power goes down with distance. This we call path loss. Then there will be variations of the power with distance that are operating at large uh, length scales. This is called shadowing. And finally, there are small variations of the received power with small distance variations. So this is uh, at the level of a few wavelengths. And this is called multipath. So these three impairments, they can add up at the dB scale. So path loss depending on distance, shadowing due to blockage, and multipath due to reflection, scattering, and diffraction each happening at different length scales. While this simplified model with three components um, is really simple, it turns out to well characterize the performance of wireless communication in these complex propagation environments. It then becomes important to have suitable models for each of these three components to use in system design and analysis. For path loss, we will use a deterministic model. For shadowing and multipath fading, a random model, which we will see later. First of all, for path loss, there exist many models depending on the environment in which measurements were taken. For instance, this is a picture from the book where we show as a function of distance a multi-slope path loss model. The most simple model for path loss is the single slope model where the received power is a function of the transmitted power times some constant and d to the minus gamma, okay, normalized with some reference distance d0. So this here will be the most simple model for path loss that one can use for system design. An important parameter here is the path loss exponent, which relates to the slope. And this path loss exponent will depend on the specific propagation environment and can range from very small values, even less than two, to very large values up to six or seven here in urban macro cells. Shadowing, the effect due to large objects in the environment is again very complex and we use a simple model, which is a large scale random variation around the path loss. Turns out from experiment that the log normal model is quite good. So the compound effect of shadowing and path loss in the DB domain could be written as a Gaussian 
with a mean that depends on the path loss and a certain shadowing variance. If we consider the shadowing separately from the path loss, then the shadowing will be zero mean and the variance that depends on the shadowing variance. Okay, so we recall that in the B domain, the different effects, they add up. The received power is a transmitted power plus a path loss factor, a shadowing and multipath. The log normal distribution is shown here on the left hand side. We note that the log normal distribution has a mass close to zero, significant mass close to zero. Finally, we know that shadowing itself is correlated over space. So when we have two receivers, x1 and x2, with a distance d between them, the shadowing in both locations will be in the db domain Gaussian with variance sigma squared here. But also the shadowing will be correlated. And this is because if there's a big obstacle in between, the shadowing seen by the receiver x1 is almost the same as the shadowing seen by the receiver x2. So for this, we can figure out what is the autocorrelation function as a function of distance between the two receivers. And this is known as the Goodmanson model. And it turns out that outdoors shadowing is correlated over distances between 5 and 100 meters. Indoors, this is typically less than 10 meters. In this slide, we go in further detail regarding the log normal and normal distribution. So let's suppose that there is a receiver 100 meters away from a transmitter and due to path loss, the received power is minus 110 dBm. On top of this, there's a shadowing with standard deviation of 3.65 dB, again in the dB domain. So then the received power at 100 meter due to path loss alone would be this value, minus 110 dBm. Due to path loss, we actually will receive a variable that could be more or that could be less due to shadowing with a Gaussian distribution in the dB domain. If we then convert to linear scale, then we have the log normal distribution, the received power due to path loss alone would be here 0.1 times 10 to the minus 10 watts. And due to, path, due, due to shadowing on top of this, we would receive a power either less or more according to this log normal distribution. So the important thing of this slide is that the normal and the log normal distribution are very different. In the design of communication systems, an important notion is outage probability. So there's a probability that the received power falls below some threshold. And this threshold could be related to the minimum power needed for the receiver to capture the data from the transmitter. When we have path loss only, and we have a transmitter, then the power will decay with distance away from the transmitter. This means that at some point the power will fall below the threshold p-min. And for every distance less than the threshold p-min, the outage probability will be zero. This means we will be in a good condition to receive data from the transmitter. And outside of this, the outage probability will be 1, and we will not be able to receive any data from the transmitter. Okay, so the outage probability as a function of distance from the transmitter is either 0 or 1. And there's a certain threshold distance after which we are not able to receive the data from the transmitter anymore. With path loss and shadowing, things become a little bit more subtle. So the outage probability at a certain location x at a certain distance away from the transmitter is a probability that the received power is less than the threshold. This is equal to the probability that the received power in dBm is less than the threshold in dBm. And we know that the received power can be written as a function of the transmit power and the distance and the path loss exponent and the shadowing as follows. The only thing that's random here is the shadowing. Okay, so this is a normal distribution, zero mean and a certain variance. So we can solve this now to figure out what is the, this probability using the Q function. We can now visualize the outage probability as a function of distance and it would look something like this. So when we're very close to the transmitter, outage probability will be very small. And when we get further and further away, outage probability will increase up to 1. But it also means that there are certain locations close to the transmitter for which we can have an outage. And there can be certain locations far away from the transmitter for which we will not have an outage. We got lucky and the shadowing worked in our favor. The final effect, multipath fading, will only be covered here in one slide, but we will devote the next two lectures to this in more detail. So different paths from a transmitter to a receiver will add up. Okay, and this adding up can be destructive or constructive. If we were to look at the signal seen by a receiver, it would look something like this. So we have the first path, and then we see all the multipath components arriving. 
We only would see this if the receiver would be able to sample the signal at an extremely high rate. This is called wideband communication. If instead the receiver would have a low-pass filter and sample at a very low rate, this is what the receiver would see. This is called narrowband communication. So even though these two instances of communication happen over the same physical channel, they appear very differently at the receiver. Wideband with many components and narrowband here with only one signal, all kind of blurred. All these components from the left-hand side are blurred together into one signal here on the right-hand side. The signal also varies over time due to mobility. Okay, so here we have time. On the y-axis we have the receive power and we see that the receive power fluctuates with distance. And here we see over one second that the receive power has fluctuated somewhat. When the receiver moves faster, then we will see the same kind of fluctuation but at a much faster time scale. So this is here for 0.2 seconds, we see lots of fluctuations. So this effects of mobility, wideband and narrowband and the multiple adding up of propagation paths is the topic of the next two lectures. These were the learning outcomes of today. So we've seen uh, the, the freeze law, which you should be able to state and interpret, the differences between path loss shadowing and multipath fading, uh, different path loss models, so the single slope and multi-slope, and also you should be able to compute outage probability due to shadowing and path loss.